Hello again. Today I will be talking about two horrifying aspects of warfare. Chlorine gas, mustard gas, phosgene gas, and tear gas, and all other sorts of chemical warfare, as well as one of the most notorious symbols of the Great War, shell shock. Now as far as gas went in terms of its usefulness, it was not at all that useful if your goal was to kill enemy troops. Oh, so why was gas such a big part of the Great War? Well, that I would be happy to explain. Let us simply look back into the magical wonders of history. Now the reason why chemical warfare was so effective in World War I was because it crushed morale. I mean, just imagine that you're standing in your trench and all of a sudden there's this big looming cloud of white or sometimes greenish gas coming towards you. And you know that if you don't get your gas mask on on time, then you're gonna be in for a lot of suffering. Although they could do pretty advanced surgeries during the Great War, gas was not one of those strong points for medical technology. It was really awful. In some cases, patients would simply be leaned up against a wall of a hospital or infirmary to die over the course of several weeks. Shouldn't there be a fart joke in there? No, this is not funny. It's depressing. Now, a little bit into the history of chemical warfare. Most people think it was the Germans who first released gas during the war. However, it was actually the French who released tear gas in 1914, but it was the Germans who did release chlorine gas during the Second Battle of Ypres. This was on December 19th, 1915. Now it was Fritz Haber, a German chemist, who was really the father of chlorine gas. He was so intent to prove the worthiness of his creation, however, he even was at the Second Battle of Ypres to personally give the order to release the gas. Now here's the crazy thing. There was a meeting held in 1899 and another one in 1907 where most of the world's countries came together to discuss types of warfare that was so painful to soldiers that they would be banned from war entirely. Gas was one of them. Ironically, the United States, who you think would be pretty intent on keeping peace, seeing as most of the time they've been a country, they've been in some war, was not interested at all in the conference. Before there were gas masks, soldiers wore gauze soaked in anti-gas solutions and goggles to protect themselves from these harmful chemicals. Eventually, real gas masks were created, and believe it or not, despite the fact that it used charcoal to filter out the gas, they actually worked. So what did this gas and other new types of weaponry mean for the troops who were actually fighting in the war? It meant shell shock, which is today known as PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. It's had many other names dependent on what war was going on that influenced it, but here's how it worked. Shell shock was caused by prolonged exposure to intense combat and shells, resulting in a breakdown of one's nervous state. Some doctors at the time theorized that it was simply just the result of what happens when a shell passes really close by the human head. Either way, it means that you're not getting to sleep at night without one of these. Now there were many symptoms that shell shock was occurring in one's body. Some of these include uncontrollable shaking, a lack of sleep, and something known as railway spine. Railway spine was called so because usually the patients who had it were victim to train crashes. It basically made you walk in a really awkward way. Now, there were several different ways people thought they could treat shell shock, one of which was actually um, almost correct in that the patient would need to have a close relationship with the doctor to better enhance their mental capabilities, basically meaning if we're friendly to them, they're going to get better. But others were not so great, seeing as in some cases doctors would simulate the sounds of shells to get the patient back into a state of mental collapse so that they could overcome it. But worst of all, a lot of times, doctors would shock their patients. Yes, shocks to the head, some of which were strong enough to start cars, which raised questions of whether patients deserve some sort of rights to what should be done on them. Wrap this video up. If you were alive at the time, you do not want to be succumbed to gas. You do not want to be succumbed to shell shock. And you definitely don't want to be fighting in this war. Please do consider watching my next video. Have a nice day.